David Zeritsky for the Bond Experience. Welcome back. We've got a really big discussion ahead of us. How big is it? Well, we're going to be talking about marketing, merchandising, promotion, and advertising. That's a lot. But we're going to make it even bigger because we're going to time travel today. We're going to go back to the 60s and then go all the way to the present. Folks, I'm exhausted just even talking about the subject. So exhausted, I had to ask a special friend on this podcast today to really help me. Bill Koenig, welcome to the show. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. I need this help today. I couldn't do this alone. But Bill, for those who may not know your name or your face, tell everybody what corner of the Bond community do you inhabit? Well, I run a blog called The Spike Man, which is which is at hmssweblog.wordpress.com. And that blog has been going strong since 2008. Earlier, I was a contributor to the Her Majesty's Secret Servant website, which began in 1997. The blog initially was an offshoot of the website. And then later, uh, HMSS went offline. And, you know, so the blog went independent. But, uh, you know, that, that's what I do. Excellent. And by the way, I have got to, I've got to tell for everybody out there, um, I was very excited. It's the first time Bill and I are really connecting like this. But I'll tell you what it was. When you, um, you are a prominent voice on James Bond and Friends, which I think has been one of the best uh, new podcasts. I wouldn't even call it new anymore, but it's very exciting. Um, really, there's, there's no shackles. You guys talk about everything and anything. There's no restrictions. But, Bill, you, I, I always say to my friend uh, Joe Darlington, you're like the Wikipedia of James Bond and, and also the spy <laughs> genre in general. And I said, if there's anybody that can help me with talking about James Bond from the 1960s onward, it's you. So no pressure. Well, you know, James Bond was a big part of my childhood starting in 1965. So... I hope I can contribute here. <laughs> I'm sure you can. Well, I'll tell you where this conversation started from. A lot of people have been, uh, you know, talking about the brands of Bond and, you know, in the 90s and, and certainly today, there, you know, there's all this promotion and it's, it's bombarding. And, and it was interesting, oh, mea culpa, you know, there was an ad campaign around uh, NPL cashmere and it was kind of in everybody's face and uh, it might have been too much too fast. But one of the things I wanted to step back and really talk about the fact that James Bond marketing and promotion advertising has been here kind of since the dawn of the first cinematic Bond. But I don't know if that's true. I mean, Dr. No, did they really have promotion back then for the movie? I don't know so much about Dr. No. I came in in 65 because um, my first experience with Bond was a television special called The Incredible World of James Bond. Now, it was really a glorified infomercial, but you really, but it was actually, but it was done so well. You really, I mean, I, I see that as an adult, but when I saw it, when I think back to seeing it as a kid, I was blown away because right. um, they, the funny thing is, I mentioned this somewhere else, that um, originally Sean Connery is supposed to be the narrator. And then he pulls out at the last minute and they hired this character actor named Alexander Scorby. He was a solid character actor, but he was blessed with what I call the voice of God. And so as a result, in addition to doing acting gigs, he, he got all sorts of voiceover work oh as well. And so he got hired to replace Connery more or less at the last minute. And so when you watch it, it seems more like a serious documentary than an infomercial. But I mean, mm -hmm. it was made to promote Thunderbolt. Right. Um, it came out in November of 65, but, you know, like I said, hearing him talk and he's died some years ago, but he, it sounds like really serious and sounds like a, you know, an actual documentary. And it's, um, and so from that moment on, I was sold and I ended up, you know, seeing Thunderball sometime in the spring of 66. I didn't see it like right when in at Christmas, but I saw it a few months later at a drive-in. Right. And that was, that's when kind of the, the spy genre became really, you know, an, an echelon, a high level thing. You couldn't walk into. I mean, I have something here. You couldn't walk into Sears, you know, or, or right. any of these places and, and not see one of these. Or I remember uh, Gilbert had come out with, you know, figurines that people could have. 
Yeah, and those, actually, those figurines you just held up were some of the first James Bond things I had. Now, being a kid, I destroyed them because I'm playing with them. <laughs> I'll mail it's these like, to you. I wish, my, I wish my parents would have bought a second set to save for me when I was right. an adult. But, um, and I'll describe those later. But those, those, those were a, a serious uh, thing in the, in, at Christmas of 65. because I got, That was a result. But, but, but those toys were created to take advantage of the popularity of the movies. Yes. They, weren't, they weren't produced to get butts in seats into the right. theater. They, they weren't yes. to drive there. Yes, and there was also now I didn't I didn't get this, but I saw I remember seeing it in the Sears catalog. There was this James Bond racing set. It was like two cars. One was an Aston Martin. I've I've seen pictures of the ads. I guess it cost thirty four ninety nine and sixty five, which was a fortune. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I didn't have that, but I had those figurines and um, and other things. So. Yeah, so yeah, it, it it was very much take advantage of of the whole spy thing, and and I've said this before about Thunderball. I believe that Thunderball, they you know, Eon made the exact right moves because they came out with like a big spectacle film. Because by the fall of '65, at least here in the United States, there were spies all over TV, yes. and so seeing Thunderball, you saw something you could not see on TV, you could not see anywhere else. You saw, and, and again, I, I have all this emotional <laughs> attachment to the jetpack. And it's oh, like yeah. on screen for what, a minute or so? But it's yeah. still like, it's amazing. Like seeing, I was seven years old and seeing it, and it's just, it just blew you away. And then it, and then the whole, the underwater fights and all that stuff. Um, and by the way, what you're, what you're talking about, um, marketers today, use nostalgia as an incredibly powerful marketing device. Uh, it's, it's interesting you say Thunderball. I don't know if you had one of these as a kid, but around the time of Thunderball, they came oh. out with all this VoIP equipment. But what okay. they did was they emblazoned it with 007. Now this one's also a water gun as well, <laughs> which is a lot of fun. But, but what's interesting is, is every time I hold some of these things up, like the Corgi card as someone like you or myself that have lived through that, nostalgia is really used as a leverage point to to drive the franchise i think in a lot of cases right and there were other spy things not bond there was during that same period and the one thing i remember getting was a man from uncle cap gun and so like on the show the man from uncle in real life they took a p38 and then you put a shoulder stock you put a sight on top you put this uh, attachment on the uh, on the barrel, mm -hmm. and it put this extended magazine, and it looked like the coolest thing ever. And so, like, I had a cap gun version of that. Um, oh my gosh! And but yeah, your so, parents got rid of that too. Well, again, you know, your kids, you play with it, and you know, like <laughs> pull the trigger, and it's like you know, within a year or two, you've destroyed it because you played exactly. with it so often. Oh my gosh! Now, do you remember because um, you know I was born in 1968. Uh, my first movie that I remember that I think I was brought to was The Spy Who Loved Me. But in the 60s, do you remember how they dressed the theater? Was it just lobby cards? Was it full posters? Could you get the excitement like you do today? See, I saw Thunderball at a drive-in, so like ah. no lobby cards. Right. And I saw You Only Live Twice in a drive-in. Mm-hmm. And no lobby cards either. In fact, with right. You Only Live Twice, when I saw it, it was the bottom half of double feature with the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, the only thing those two had in common was they were released by United Artists. Right. Um, but, um, you know, the first I saw it in an indoor theater was on Her Majesty's Secret Service. But I don't really remember about the lobby cards and stuff. I mean, you know, because by this time I kind of knew the basics of Bond and wasn't really yeah. looking for that stuff. Uh, I do, but I do remember being like heartbroken when Tracy got killed at the end because my dad he had read the novel, and right. so when I got home, oh, so Bill, what do you think? And I'm like, I'm totally weirded out. I said, well, <laughs> he kind of shrugged his shoulders. He knew what happened. And did you, but you didn't know that was coming then. That was a total surprise to you. Oh, total surprise. I was, oh. you know, because I, because I had seen the Avengers on TV because, you know, the Avengers, of course, were on British television, but they were imported into the U.S. in the fall of 66. 
Mm -hmm. So I had seen Diana Rigg. And so, so yeah, seeing Mrs. Peel killed in the movie, like, ah! Oh, that's awful. And by yeah. the way, um, on Her Majesty's Secret Service, it's kind of neat that that was your first in-theater experience because, yeah. um, and I've, I've become a quasi-historian of this stuff, that was one of the very first Bond films that they did what's called an exhibitor campaign. And I don't okay. know if you've, you've looked into this, but it's basically... Uh, it, Every theater is given kind of a Bond Bible that says, here's all the merchandise that you can use. Here's six posters, three T-shirts. Uh, here's some giveaways. Oh, and by the way, when you do the local newspaper campaign, here are the images. And you can't ah. do this, but you can't do that. Um, and and there, well, there were restrictions, essentially. Well, interestingly, today here in the 21st century, theaters now have bars and um I remember going to see Skyfall and seeing like they the the bar in the theater had this list of specials and they had a Skyfall special. I forget what was in it, but it's like it costs so much like I'm not going to get that. It was <laughs> <laughs> Well, they got to give a percentage to the mothership. That's, that's probably so, expensive. yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, I, I, at what point? I mean, cuz I know for me it was really around the Roger Moore era. I I was obviously a young man and and you know, everybody has their first Bond. I mean, Roger Moore was my first Bond um, and still is, it, for me, a very charming Bond. You know, we could laugh and have fun with his movies. But right. I, I do remember certain things. Like, I remember Wonder Bread, you know, Wonder Bread having, like, little cards in them that had Roger Moore, even here in the United States. But my friends over in England, it was everywhere. I mean, yeah. do, you, do you know much about that promotion around the Roger Moore movies? Oh, I have to admit I don't. Because by the 70s, I'm, I'm 10 years older than you are. So by the 70s, I, most, of the, most of the 70s, I'm either in high school or in college. And so I'm going to the movies, but I'm not really being subjected or not really getting exposure to those kinds of promotions. Um, yeah. So I, you know, in, when we exchanged some emails about this, I, I, I kind of had to admit, thinking to myself, the 70s are probably like the least thing I'm prepared to talk about. No, that's um, totally fine. I, I will say that um, this, in the 70s, the most bizarre thing that I found in doing a lot of research around this was, again, they had these uh, exhibitor campaign books, yeah. these promotional books. And then right. you would have really kind of, I wouldn't say adult movies, but not ones that you would take uh, a five or six-year-old to. But in the lobby, they actually gave theaters coloring pages james bond coloring pages wow uh, yeah i know in fact i even found some never say never again ones i found a view to a kill one that they would have in stacks that kids could go home and color either after the movie or, dur or during and this was the most uh, i knew you'd get a kick out of this because you're a historian. <laughs> um this is actually a razor that they had when they were promoting live and let die it's the same exact razor he uses oh, okay. when he's shaving and then the snake comes it's down tough. Yeah. Yes, it's a it's a Schick, and Schick actually, um, I have the letter would send theaters a note saying, "Would you like free samples to give to the men in your theater that are going to see Live and Let Die?" And then they could do newspaper promotion. So even lifestyle items like this were being promoted in the theater, which is crazy. Well, you know, one thing that did get promoted in the seventies, and and also with Live and Let Die, was that uh, Pulsar, the time computer. And you guys remember the first scene with Roger oh, Moore yes. in Live and Let Die, you know, he, you know, there's a knock on the door, he wakes up and he checks his yep. watch and it's a Pulsar. And Pulsar was doing other promotions elsewhere. I don't know if it was the TV series Kojak, but it was showing up on TV shows around that right. same time. And then of course, but apparently the Pulsar was just a loner <laughs> until Bond got his, got his Rolex back. Uh, from Q, but uh... I love that you remember that because um, I'm a watch guy, and one of the things that I do know is Pulsar and Seiko. They actually, for every single Roger Moore movie, they would have sweepstakes, and they would give watches away. So in the theater, you walk in, and very often they would have a dummy model of the watch, and I'm going to blow yeah. your mind away in a second. A dummy model of the watch, and then obviously you could win the watch. That was. That was one of the very first instances where watch companies were starting to have contracts yeah. with the James Bond films and trying to market them. 
But here's here's the biggest thing I found out, and I could not believe it, and it's going to drive you and me crazy. Mont Blanc, you probably already know this, but obviously Octopussy, the Mont Blanc pen that he uses right. as a gadget, yeah, that he listens in on, et cetera, and it's got the acid. Eon actually asked UK theaters if they would like dummy screen use props to put in their theaters on display. They had 10 of them. And sure enough, I think they sent some of these out. Now, whether they came back or not, I don't know. But to me, again, it was just one of these mind-numbing things. I, I would never imagine Eon doing that today. No, no, I can't either. <laughs> um, real quick on Pulsar, the time computer, if you look at the end titles of yeah. uh, Live and Let Die, you know, there's a long list of special thanks to. And it's like Pulsar, and it's like, I think it's the reserve mark, an R inside of a circle. You know, Pulsar trait whatever that is the time computer and then another one <laughs> so yeah that was clearly a, a deal that had been struck and it's you know even though he ends up spending most of the movie wearing a rolex yeah. you do see you know it, they they definitely drew attention to the pulsar they did. I, by the way oh yeah go ahead. i was going to say because i know for like part of the 70s i had i don't know if it was a pulsar but i had that same thing the digital watch and my recollection is they didn't last that long but Anyway, <laughs> well, it's interesting because I think, you know, the whole and I don't think it's legend. I think it's probably true when uh, the spy who loved me came out. And obviously nobody expected Jaws, who was supposed to be this terrifying villain, to be this adored individual. I mean, right. you know, the fans loved him. Right. And so yeah. he came back in Moonraker. What what they what they wound up doing, because they knew that Jaws was such a hit for Moonraker, they actually wound up making costumes <laughs> for messed. kids. <laughs> yeah, so this was from a company called Ben Cooper, and now kids not only adored Jaws, they could be Jaws for Halloween. And you so know, it's, it's funny about Jaws, for like the first 20, 25 minutes he's in The Spy of Love Me, he's like terrifying. But then once he drops the big boulder on his foot, it's like from that moment on, it's all different. It's um, true. Yeah. It's like who would who would who would dislike Wildy e. Coyote? We love Wildy e. yeah. Coyote, right? Because you know he's never going to catch the Roadrunner, so therefore it's more innocent. <laughs> oh my but the gosh! But the funny thing is, and I actually mentioned this on a recent uh, James Bond and Friends. So, so in the Spy Love Me, he doesn't talk, but then and then they did this novelization and they gave this whole backstory and they explained why he didn't talk. He had some, you know, Christopher Wood did the novelization even. So it was like, yeah, he had had some kind of operation and that's why, you know, to install the teeth, but they had to like sever some kind of nerve and it's all this explanation. But then in Moonraker, he can talk. Uh, <laughs> but, but the thing is, Richard Keel had the same shtick a decade earlier on the wild, wild west. Now, for those who don't know what the Wild Wild West is, it combined spies with cowboys. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in the third episode, they introduced Dr. Loveless, who was like less than four feet tall. You know, the actor's name was Michael Dunn. He's like, you know, similar to Hervé Villachez. You know, it's that, you know, kind of condition. Right. And um, Richard Keel was his henchman, Voltaire. And, oh my gosh. and he couldn't talk. And so, so in that first season, they had four Dr. Loveless episodes and Voltaire was in three, but in the third, suddenly he could talk. Um, so it's funny, like the Bond series kind of ended up intentionally or not kind of <laughs> drawing upon Richard Keel's previous experience playing henchmen and villains. He became typecast as this silent giant. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. It's yeah. Funny. I, I, it's interesting too, and you'll appreciate this because you may be 10 years older than me, but I think we're both from the era where, you know, merchandising and things like that was, it, it was a, definitely a different time. For example, yes. I don't think you would see any of these in a uh, toy store nowadays. No. So not no, only is guns. it Roger Moore, but I mean, it's, it's a cap gun. Would you ever find a gun nowadays in a toy store? Well, like I, like I said earlier, I, you know, the man from uncle had a cap gun in the sixties and it was made by ideal, I believe. And I got one of them for Christmas. So yeah, no, no, you wouldn't get that today. Not, not, yeah. not a chance. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love about that. That was really interesting. Cause again, clearly it's a, it's a child's toy, 
but it came with a coupon for tickets to the movie. So clearly they wanted the kids to also go see the Bond movies, which right. nowadays, you know, I, this is going to be a, a terrible thing and I'm sure it's going to make people bristle, but the way some kids are bubble wrapped today, I can't imagine a young, you know, child going to a James Bond film. There was a quote attributed to, I think, Harry Saltzman saying, Bond films are sadism for the whole family. Uh, <laughs> like, oh, you, wouldn't get that, you wouldn't get that quote today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bringing that back, damn it. I'm going to put that on Instagram. I love that. All right, so we move into out of Roger Moore and we move into Timothy Dalton. Are we starting to, are starting to see more? Or are we starting to hear and see less with Timothy Dalton? In the 80s, still in the Roger Moore era, there were these role-playing games. And, like, I, I don't know a whole lot about them, because, but I remember seeing advertisements for them. Um, now, by the 80s, like, okay, I'm an adult and I'm, I'm working for a living. I don't really have time to, like, get games. But I remember seeing the ads. And they were, like, the ads in Starlog Magazine was, like, one place you might see the ads. And there were other outlets where I, I, I remember seeing the ads. Oh, and I want to say, because I just listened to Joe Darlington's interview with yeah, Raymond, Raymond Benson. Benson wrote some of those role playing uh, modules. Exactly. Right? Yeah, that's yeah. that's what I remember from the interview, and I think I remember that before. So, and again, not having had one, I I can't tell you exactly how they worked, but yeah. it's not a computer game, which would come in the more in the nineties. But again, it's like trying to draw people in. Because I remember one of those games, whether it was written by Raymond or not, was called You Only Live Twice Part Two. So I guess it was like some kind of continuation of, oh, of, wow. of that. Um, yeah, and, and also Starlog, I think, published some kind of, beyond the regular magazine, they, they published some kind of James Bond special. And I remember they had like... Um, a dossier of, of Boothroyd. And of course, it's like the way they drew it, it looked like Desmond Llewellyn, but with a mustache. So it's like they must not have had the total rights for his likeness. But like, I guess they figured by putting that mustache on that yeah. they could like massage that. And I remember it gave like a dossier. It said like Boothroyd was born in 1920 because. You know, Desmond was born in 1914. So it's like, oh, he's a little bit younger than the actor who plays him. But yeah. This, By the way, this, the is a, this is an interesting part of the conversation because a lot of people watching um, are, are in their 20s and early 30s. And, you know, Bill and I, we actually watched our trailers very much by accident. We would go to yeah. a theater or maybe something on TV. But that's a great point. Like Starlog magazine, these magazines were really our only messenger for news. We, we weren't sitting by a YouTube or anything like that back then, clearly. Well, in fact, one of the first... I consider it one of the first major James Bond pieces appeared in Starlog and it appeared in 1983 when you had the, you had Octopussy and Never Say Never Again coming out the same year. And so he was a freelance writer at the time named Lee Goldberg interviewed um, Richard Maybaum. And mm. there were like stuff that came out of that interview. I had never heard one of the, one of the thing was that, yeah, originally Jack Lord was supposed to come back to play Felix again, but that he wanted a lot more money and he wanted like billing kind of like <laughs> equal to Connery. Yeah. Billing. And, oh. and so they said, no, oh, no, thanks, Jack. And I had never heard that before. And people are like vaguely aware of it, but they don't remember where it originated. It's like, well, Richard Maybaum was the source and Starlog magazine was where it was. And, and the thing is Lee Goldberg went on to a career, and he's still active, as like a television writer producer and he's like, he writes um, suspense novels. And, uh, but seriously, that is, that was like one of, to me, that was like one of the major interviews that lifted a lot, you know, lifted the curtain over a lot of things. Also, the Stephen J. Rubin book that came out, first edition came out in the early 80s, that lifted a lot of stuff because up till then it was like, it was mostly publicist stuff. And yeah. it was like, and, and I remember that with the Rubin book, they didn't give him permission to use a lot of stills because he had then had to scramble to find other uh, sources of photos. A lot of them came from news services. 
Right. Um, but yeah, it, it really wasn't until the 80s that you really got an idea of a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. And it's not that it makes you think less of the series. To me, it makes, I, I think more of it. It's just that they kind of, kind of wanted to like not let people know so much. Yeah, it's true. And, and you would think with a new bond with Timothy Dalton, there'd be a little bit more crowing. One of the things I thought you'd find interesting, this, I'm literally holding one of the very first video games. Um, oh, not, okay. not the role playing video game, but it literally was just yeah. called James Bond 007. And it was it was kind of just a, a simple game, you know, um, 1983. That's when this came out. I didn't even know they were doing video games back then. But there was no event around it. There was no announcement. Literally, that game just showed up in stores. There okay. was no publicity or journal ads. And so, you know, number one, maybe they just didn't have the right vehicle to take advantage of the fans. I know that there were fanzines, of course, back then. Yeah. But uh, they didn't have the megaphone that they have today. But with Timothy Dalton especially, you'd think that they would crow a little bit louder about a new Bond. Here in the United States, I, I don't know if a version showed up in Europe or not, but I remember ABC had a primetime special, you know, James Bond's 25th anniversary, hosted by Roger Moore. And so he's in probably like 90% of it. Right. And it was like, it was like really good. And, you know, I remember there was like this shot. It's like, not like he's really playing Bond, but there's enough to evoke. So like at one point they had this shot, again, it's on video. And he's right. like wearing the Bogner jacket. And then he like skis away from the camera. And then you go into a For Your Eyes Only clip and it like melds like really well. Wow. Um, and also, I'm trying to remember some of the other highlights. There was this, again, a this really great shot again roger moore sitting in front of the fireplace and it's like there's all these port not portraits but photographs in frames of various bond women and it's like you get the feeling it's like oh bond like thinking back kind of <laughs> having you know it's like he's remembering, have, enjoying a lot of you right. know, fond memories it was like it was really well done and it like oh, we really got to find that yeah, it really set you up for the movie to come out. And then, like, in the last five to seven minutes, you got highlights of the upcoming movie. And, of course. Yeah. Yes. But, uh, but that, was, that was really smooth. That was a well-done promotion. That really – I mean, I was ready for a new Bond, you know, because right. – you know, but I thought – but I thought Roger Moore did a really good job on that special. And and I've said before, in a lot of ways, I think Roger Moore was the ambassador of the franchise until he died. And yeah. and that was a perfect example because, okay, he's not Bond anymore, but he's, you know, he's still there kind of like promoting it and, but promoting it smoothly and not, yeah. you know, not overtly. In a very elegant way. And I, I have to say those, I remember those TV specials and those were our big events. Those were the yeah. things that would drive the excitement. I remember um, Mark Mark O'Connell's wonderful uh, book, Catching Bullets, where he talks right. about literally spending a day in London searching out for a TV guide that had Roger Moore on the front of it. Because yeah. that, was, that was the way we consumed things. That was what we ate up. Well, and also just as an example with trailers, you know, it's like you didn't know that a trailer was being released this or then. So like, yeah. I remember going to, she was my fiance at that time, now my wife, been my wife for a long time. And we like went to some movie. I, I couldn't even tell you the movie, but it was like the teaser, ended up being the teaser trailer to Moonraker. And so you had, the, it had this kind of odd beginning that actually it began with uh, Corinne, getting chewed on by the dogs like what's this but it didn't really know and then it like switched and then it became clearly this was for moonraker and it included oh from the venice sequence with the with the assassin inside the coffin and mm -hmm. him trying to kill bond and then bond throwing the knife back at him yeah. and just yeah and i remember my wife my future wife lee Taylor said we're going to see this movie and so Ooh. it's like because that's like yeah, it's, it would be a surprise. You you didn't yeah. know when a trailer was coming. Now it's like it's all very... We get you know, upset. We're like, yeah. where's my trailer? Where's right. my trailer? 
Yeah, and it just, you know, you didn't know. And, you know, the first time I remember about people going to see movies just to catch a trailer was like 1989 with Batman, you know, the you know the Michael Keaton, mm -hmm. <laughs> Tim Burton Batman. That's the yeah. first time I remember people specifically buying a ticket to a movie. They go and they see the trailer and then they leave because <laughs> I'm just here to see the Batman trailer. Um, That's true. And by the way, the biggest takeaway so far 30 minutes in that I'm taking from you is if a woman leans over and whispers that we're going to see that Bond film, you marry her. You just <laughs> marry her. That's my big takeaway here. Oh, you're, you're onto something. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I have to tell you, and I think you might find this interesting, the Timothy Dalton movies were the first time that Eon, Dan Jack, would actually send um, significant, I mean, legal restrictions that there can be no promotion of the actor's picture unless it's authorized. So these are the pictures you can use because there was some infractions um, from what I hear from A View to a Kill where people were using Roger Moore's likeness and then the View to a Kill title, um, car wash. You know, go, oh. go to John's local car wash, A View to a Kill, Roger Moore. Oh. So they oh, literally, because I've read some of these Bond campaign books and some of them legally threaten the movie theater owner that if you use any of this for promotion other than the film we will seek action which was kind of interesting to me yeah now speaking of view to a kill this is something else this is the first time i remember this so i did not watch mtv very often but for some reason i happened to have it on and then mm. suddenly i'm seeing the james bond gun barrel and the music like what's this I, yeah. of course i stop and, you know, it's a gun barrel that opens up, but it opens up with the Eiffel Tower. And then you see an extended clip of View to a Kill from the, that sequence. And then it goes in, then eventually goes into the music uh -huh. video for the song. And I was like, yeah. whoa. It's yeah. like, I, I, was, I was blown away by that. Um, That's a great point. Is that the first video slash you know um push to the theater because that was a big one that was aha that did that you know meeting you well i mean not it, not aha it was uh duran duran oh it's duran duran oh my gosh yeah yeah I, sorry here's my um, bond card back i'm giving you my bond no, card. no 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 it's it's no but but i you know what i think there had been maybe a couple music videos but that was the first one that i saw that actually you know included the the gun barrel included yeah. scene, you know, scenes with dialogue from the movie because it's like Roger Moore with that detective who had been hired, mm -hmm. and they're talking about this. And then, um, oh, and then uh, Mayday, you know, kills the guy. Now the funny thing is, like, okay, by that time I'd read the Stephen J. Rubin book, and so this idea about the butterfly or something like it had come up before, but they couldn't find, you know, it didn't work out. So it's like, oh, okay, they're going. They finally found a way to work the butterfly in. Oh my um, gosh! But but it was amazing. It's like, okay, I was really hyped up for the movie at that point. Right. And, uh, and it's funny. View to a Kill has a mixed reaction these days. But um, yes. I know you and Joe talked about it uh, on a recent <laughs> yeah. video, and some people like criticize you guys. No, 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 don't worry about it. It's like I I, I understand because. I remember going in to see the movie and it's like the first two minutes, I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be a classic. And then the Beach Boys song comes on. It's like, yeah. uh, oh, <laughs> really? Uh, but I mean, to me, it was, you know, we, we're not here to talk about that in detail, but, <laughs> but then it got back on track and I, you know, there's, there's a lot of scenes in that I like, but I understand about, you know, a lot of people feel that Roger stayed on too long. He said he stayed on too long after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, but just again, in terms of, you know, promotion and, and uh, product stuff, that MTV video was a, was a big, that was a big step forward, I thought, at yeah. the time. Well, it's interesting. I spoke to a lot of people around the Timothy Dalton era because even in my research and, you know, my years of kind of looking at marketing and promotion, because it's kind of like, you know, a little bit of an offshoot hobby and looking at this, it was hard to find a lot of things. They, of course, did promotion. They did phone promotions. They did a lot of things with Phillips. Um, yeah, you know, the, yes. The, 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 uh, the find or the whistle. Yes. You know, that whole thing. Uh, shavers, et cetera. But 
it went a little dormant, certainly between uh, License to Kill, yeah, License to Kill and Goldeneye, there was this very quiet period. I mean, what do you think kept Bond alive during that point? Was it the fans and books? Fans and books, and also um, the movies going on TV, because up until 89, mm. the the movies were on TV, but it was like very controlled. And like, Ironically, this is one of the things that, that caused the lawsuit between Dan Jack and MGM that kind of began that long hiatus. Yeah. So at one point, MGM had fallen under control of this guy who was, well, a crook. And he had sold the TV rights cheap because he was like needing some cash to close the deal. And so suddenly, uh, here in the United States, Bond went from being on occasionally on ABC to being on TBS and TBS had the seven nights of James Bond kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. And, and again, that was a result of, of MGM's kind of weird stuff going on. But I think that took it to a whole nother level. And it's like, I remember that. Okay. All right. Um, I don't want to go too far afield. So I remember that first promotion, seven mm -hmm. nights of 007. And then TBS also at the time was showing the Beverly Hillbillies. So they had a related promotion, the three uh. nights of Double Knot Jethro. Because, okay, <laughs> for, for, for those, okay, really quick, really quick lesson. Um, the Beverly Hillbillies was this long-running TV comedy from 62 to 71. And around 65, they milked several episodes with Jethro Bodine is like, he's, he, he sees... Goldfinger, and he's like, he's got to be a double knot spy. I, uh, he's oh. found his life, and it's a, it's, it is hilarious. Um, I've seen it, and I've seen it more <laughs> than once. It, it is really hilarious. But in fact, I think it's like the first time you had the joke about why did he just shoot him? Because Jethro comes home, he was supposed to be getting stuff for Granny, right? And instead, he went to see Goldfinger, and he tells. Jed clap at the whole plot of Goldfinger. <laughs> and then finally, Jed's listening and says, well, why don't you just shoot him? And then Jethro is like crestfallen. He, he's smiling and then he just, uh, he just <laughs> can't, he can't explain it. I'm it's so like, watching this. I didn't even know this existed. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. And he decides to then rig the, rig their truck to be a spy car. And he's got, oh, here's my bulletproof shield. It's like a metal tub. <laughs> well, that's great, boy. How do you see all that thing? Oh, I haven't thought about that yet. <laughs> oh, my it's just, gosh. It's a whole series of gags like this. And um, anyway, sorry, I, I, I dragged us. No, I, I love it because I'm going to go watch. That's what I'm doing after we talk. Are you kidding? I love that. <laughs> but, so so Timothy Dalton, uh, this, this expanse of time, yes, I agree. It's almost like now between like the, the Craig... Last thing, you've got fans and you've got books, you've got other things kind of keeping it afloat. But with Goldeneye, I mean, suddenly, you know, you've got all this promotion again. You've got, yes. you know, you couldn't walk into a theater without, this was your drink um, yes. well before the movie came out. So is it that they just got their act together for, for Pierce Brosnan and Goldeneye? In 1994, in October, they actually hired a company that had done a lot of... Um, Star Trek conventions. So they announced we're having a James Bond convention. What? A James Bond convention? And they said, we're going to have Roger Moore and we're going to have George Lazenby. Well, I said, well, I got to go. And so like, I booked my, I booked my non-refundable air, airfare. And then it was like, oh, Roger Moore's not going to be there. As it turned out, I learned this after the fact, what, what, what the deal was. It was going to conclude with Roger Moore giving an award to Albert R. Broccoli. However, his health precluded that, so Roger Moore canceled out. Well, it's like, okay, I've got non-refundable airfare. You still got one James Bond. At that point, there had only been four. So it's like, okay, one out of four, I'm still going. And so I went, and um, you had George Lazenby. You also had Peter Hunt. You also had John Steers. There was also a showing of Goldfinger at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences the night before. They had a brand new print, they said. Um, so I went to, you know, that was part of the deal. And, um, you know, they, you also had some Bond women performers like Go Gloria Hendry, I know, was one. And there were like two or three others. So, I mean, it was a great time. 
And that was like, you know, like I said, Bond had never done anything like that before. And wow. then a year later in New York City, it was like the Sunday before the big New York premiere, they did another thing. And there was, um, you know, so Pierce Brosnan was there and others. And I've told this story on, on the podcast, but I'll repeat it here briefly. So there were two anecdotes. So they, what early part of the program, oh, try to stump the James Bond experts. So I get in line to ask my question. And I, I asked, what are the three movies where Bond doesn't wear a tuxedo? And they all confer. Raymond Benson was one of them, but there were like four or five. And then they say, well, we've talked it over and we can only identify two. Uh, you only live twice and live and let die. And then I said, well, I think you have to add from Russia with love to that because it's Bond's double who wears the tux, not Bond. And then one of them says, well, that's stretching it. And then I replied, yeah, but if that's Bond, it's a very short movie then. And, <laughs> and there was this moment that's of uncomfortable. There was this moment of uncomfortable silence. I could hear somebody behind me said, I think he's got him. And then like the host decides to break the tension. Okay, you win. And so wow. I start so I start to go up and then he pulls up these 007 boxer shorts. <laughs> and I like pause a, a second and then he says, "Are you mad enough for these?" So of course, given that challenge, uh, give me them things. Um <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Then the other nice. moment of interest, again, for just bragging rights for me, was so they changed the schedule up in the afternoon. So I guess Pierce Brosnan couldn't appear quite as quick as they had said. So, so they brought out Bruce Fairstein, the screenwriter, and Michael G. Wilson, and I think Anthony Way, the associate producer. So yeah, like, you know, ask your questions. Well, earlier that summer, and I was working in Indianapolis at the time. Uh, oh, what was his name? Donald Westlake had a, had done a lecture at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. And he did an interview, newspaper interview. And he said, yeah, I'm writing the next James Bond movie. He said, no, not the movie coming out in the fall, but I mean, the next one after that. And it's like, yeah, it's going to have to do with the Hong Kong take, you know, handover, blah, blah, blah. He was like talking all about this. So like I get in line and I, you know, asked him, I said, uh, Donald Westlake says he's writing the next James Bond movie. Can you tell us anything about this? Fairstein looks at Wilson and says, he is. <laughs> and, um, oh. and just to be clear, I wasn't trying to ambush these guys, but it's right. like Westlake is like publicly saying this. And this is like, the internet was like in the early stages at that point, but people like weren't, I think at that point, people didn't realize how stuff could spread quickly. Right. And Michael Wilson said something, well, he's one of the guys we've talked to and might happen someday. I'd, I'd, I'd really be curious what kind of conversation Fairstein had with Wilson yeah. after this. But, uh, and again, I'm, it's not me being a, trying to be a smart ass or anything. It's just like, Guys, the guy is saying this. He's saying it publicly, you know. Absolutely. Well, that's, yeah. But that's it. I mean, everything publicly, whether it's today or back then, people are going to gravitate to. If anything, you were trying to be a clarifier. Like, I almost yeah. wish there was somebody there, a fan, when Michael G. Wilson, uh, this time around in Jamaica, said, we never we never announced the titles. Because right. a fan could have said, I'm sorry, Michael G. It's just, you know, we do. We yeah, have. yeah. Yeah. Uh, but just a quick clarification is all you need sometimes. Yeah, and there's sometimes I I kind of uh, I hesitate to say something because I don't want to want to appear overly critical. But I think sometimes Eon needs people who are like a little more with it in that regard and kind of anticipate stuff because I think Eon has kind of gotten used to kind of having things things their own way because again going back to that 95 convention they never did that again that was like you had those two conventions and that was it why why didn't there's nothing better than events large-scale events to drive discussion why didn't they do it was it a failure what do you know about it i don't know i honestly don't know i just think that you know i 
this is strictly a guess. I think they got what they wanted out of the 94 and 95 events. At that point, the series was back on track and maybe it just wasn't a priority again. I don't know. Yeah. Well, with I will say with the Brosnan era, I mean, you know this all too well, between Omega watches, um, <laughs> I've got, these were actually <laughs> sold in the theater. This is the Protector 3D. I think this yeah. was from The World Is Not Enough. Um, and then you've got, obviously, Heineken coasters that were literally sold within the theater and for Heineken promotion. I mean, did it seem like the Brosnan era was where just everything exploded promotionally in an you know, overt way? I, I remember they did, they did, Heineken did a couple of spots with Bond. One was they had a series of guys who, who you know, people whose real name was James Bond. You know, like bowling alley, yes. bowling alley manager. My name is Bond. James Bond, yeah, African American musician. My name is Bond. James Bond. Yeah. Uh, I think he might have been with a group called the Gallants, but I'm not positive. They they didn't specify that in the commercial, but right. he also, if if he is with the Gallants, he has a man from Uncle Ty as well, and it was just different guys, and that that was part of the gag. And then they had another. Th it was Visa. Now I remember, Visa oh, had yeah. this. Visa had this thing with. Pierce Brosnan and Desmond Llewellyn and Bond is like going through all these security mm -hmm. checks, including checking the eye retinal patterns and stuff. Yeah. And then he tries to pay for something not with a visa card. All these alarms yeah. go off. So yeah, it, it definitely got amped up during the, during the um, uh, Brosnan era. And here's another one because actually this, actually uh, actually wrote about this in my day job at the time at the, you know i was working at bloomberg in 2000 in the early 2000s and uh ford did this deal and it was reported to be worth 35 million dollars but it's not like they paid them 35 million rather it's like right. they would buy 35 million dollars worth of, of ads and so so forth yeah but they ford did a deal for die another day that's when you know they'd been doing the BMWs and then they switched back to Aston Martin. But it mm -hmm. wasn't just Aston Martin because at the time Ford owned Volvo, they yeah. owned Land Rover, they Jaguar. owned Jaguar. Yeah. And so it was the whole array of Ford European luxury brands. And so yeah, they, you know, so Ford definitely bought ads that promoted die another day and you know mm -hmm. there's a ton of those vehicles and they even tossed in a ford thunderbird because that's what uh, yes. jinx drove to the ice yeah. palace so um they had to have a little bit of everything well i for me at least and i remember i was a young executive with folding money for the first time for me i thought goldeneye not so much there were perrier <clears throat> perrier cans that went exploding right yeah that yeah the, that, <clears throat> that the tank drove through but for some reason with tomorrow never dies and then certainly um, then you have the world is not enough. It seemed overt. It seemed yeah. like they were putting it more in your face in the movie, not just yeah. outside. For me, if you look back in the 1960s, you're really hard pressed, even even with Roger Moore, to have a brand come flying out of the screen in 3D at you. But with with Brosnan midway through, it seemed like it was a little bit more robust. One of the earliest examples was actually Goldfinger, but it was like a lot more subtle than what you just mm. described because, so there's this book called Adrian Turner on Goldfinger. Adrian Turner is this British film historian. He did a book about Goldfinger. And he, in somewhere in that book, he tells a story about Guy Hamilton's coming on the set and here's Harry Saltzman. And he's like on the set and he's like changing things out and, and Hamilton says, you know, Harry, when did you become a set dresser? Well, it turns out he had cut a deal with Gillette. So like in the in the uh, the razor with the Homer, the, the mini yeah. one. So that yeah. was a product placement deal. But it's so subtle. You really can't. Looking back now, 55 years yeah. later, you can't really tell it. But and then I used to think Kentucky Fried Chicken was um, – the product placement, but it wasn't. But it wasn't. It was, yeah, it, it wasn't. They were just trying to do because you know, they were filming it in Florida, and they just yeah. wanted something to make you think it was in Kentucky. So that's yeah, it's, it's like hitting you over the head with "Look, we're in right. Kentucky. Look." But, but but Ford, though, I mean Ford, that was Ford's big first foray into Bond yeah. movies, and so you had 
you know, they didn't own Aston Martin at the time, but you had the Mustang. That's the Mustang's first movie appearances in Goldfinger, you know, because okay. Tilly's driving that. And, you know, because it can't, you know, they would have been filming that right around the time that the Mustang was being introduced. Okay. Uh, so you had the Mustang, you have the Lincoln Continental that got crushed. Um, and then, uh, oh, Goldfinger's convoy of trucks going to Fort Knox. Mm -hmm. Those are Ford trucks. So that was like one of the early examples of deliberate product placement. But right. compared to what you see today, it's like you can miss it. <laughs> well, yeah, even in Die Another Day, he's literally, when he gets clean, he's shaving with a Norelco Spectra shaver. Yes. You can see it. And then they did a, a corresponding ad. And then on as they're panning, slow and beautiful on the bed, Brioni, 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 yes, Brioni. Yes. And it was like, if you don't get it once, you'll get it the seventh time. And even, right, you know, right. even I was like, and I love the brand discussions, but yeah, my yeah. gosh, it was overt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so so now, obviously, then we we jump to Daniel Craig. And, you know, Daniel Craig, it's it's hit an all-time level because – they were able to successfully use him, you know, an actor that, you know, it's a new type of bond. And so they really do have kind of a new approach with some of the, the marketing that they're doing. Right. And with Omega, like the thing you were just showing, like, OK, Rolex isn't really interested because they don't have to be. And so Omega is like, oh, we'll do it because, you know, they're more up and coming so to speak in the luxury watch space um yeah and in heineken i mean heineken's been active for a long time and i thought i thought there was like way too much um discussion during skyfall about heineken because yeah because heineken been active for a while i mean that's a pierce brosnan li uh, likeness it, it's actually uh, um it's uh daniel craig is it yeah, it's hard to see over the computer, but it's, it's okay. literally a Daniel Craig thing. Yeah, I know it's crazy. Okay. In fact, it says it says Skyfall. Well, any, oh, I'm sorry, I I missed the Skyfall and then, thing. And then you'll you'll love this. So the here's Coca Cola, uh, and you can see kind of Daniel Craig's yeah profile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the and by the way, is... I, the, the, what I loved about what they did, at least initially, like around Quantum of Solace. They weren't sure with Casino Royale if Daniel Craig was going to be, you know, the blonde Bond bomb or yeah. if he was really going to explode. And obviously it, it exploded. But with Quantum of Solace, they really started to understand that men want to be like James Bond. You know, that right. whole this is where kind of like kind of my corner of the Bond community with the Bond lifestyle. You're going to love this. So this was one of the campaigns in store they did for whoops, I just dropped this. For Quantum of Solace, it was it's a phone dummy, and they would have this the whole correlation here of like be like Bond, use this phone, and they had it was one of the first times in an ad campaign they put prominently the actor to be more like Bond. Yeah, which I thought was fascinating. I just had a flashback to another thing during the Brosnan era. I got a press kit from Ericsson. The, the, cell phone company right. had the deal for for uh, tomorrow never dies so they had this press kit you open up the press kit you would hear desmond llewellyn's voice pay attention 007 um oh, my but gosh. but again that was just being sent to journalists so that's just um and thing is i sold it and it's like nobody wanted to buy it i had to sell it for a dollar on ebay it was like so you take a look at this. This is a pen yeah. from Tomorrow Never Dies. And inside, it's a recording pen. And it used to, it died long ago, but it used to play the James Bond theme and a little message about Tomorrow Never Dies. I wonder if this was for the lesser known journalists. You got a really good one, but this is like <laughs> probably what they sent out to, you know, the likes of me, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. But it's amazing how creative they were getting. I think, I think with, with Daniel Craig... At least from what I could see, this is what one of the first time they really started using social media and branding and content. Um, but you you've had a lot of fun and, and you I, I love it when you guys talk about this on James Bond and Friends. You know, have they gone too far? I mean, you've got things like the Funko Pops. Um, I literally have this that came out two years ago. It's it's 007 um, underarm deodorant. 
Uh, which, by the way, they had toiletries in the '60s. I know that they, right. they did, but has it has it gone too far? Well, here's here's my concern, and I've I've expressed it on the blog, is that they do all these high end deals. Um, they did this deal with Aston Martin. Aston Martin's going to make twenty five. DB5 replicas with gadgets, and they cost. I did the conversion. I think it's. I think they're like 3.5 million each. Okay, that's great for like the one percent who've got like yeah. ridiculous amounts of money. And and oh by the way, those cars aren't street legal or no. road legal, as they say in yeah. Europe. So it's like okay. So either it, you're either like you've got so much money to throw away, you can like put it in storage or you can like rent a racetrack and drive your car on a limited basis, but you can't drive it on the street. Now, right. just in the last week or so, we've got this thing from Neiman Marcus. Oh, seven Aston Martin, whatever that model is, that costs $700,007 a piece. Yeah. And it's like, there's seven. It's like, okay, you know what? I bet they're like making tons of money off that because, you know, just because of the price point. But, those things are not going to grow the fan base. And I mean, I mean, I can understand going for it. You know, the deal makes sense. You're going to make a profit, but also $6,000 backgammon sets. This is not going to increase the James Bond fan base. It's just not. Um, and I don't know. I mean, my question is, are they doing their deals strategically or are they just kind of grabbing <laughs> you know, a chance to make a big profit up front. Yeah, and I don't it's, know. It's a fair question. I mean, I, you know, I don't know, and you may or may not have seen some of this stuff, but I've done some uh, event videos and things like that around Olabar Brown, not right. inexpensive, in yeah. fact, very expensive, and NPO Cashmere. Those guys I've known since both of those, the owners, since 2012. So they're more yeah. friends than. Than brands to me, so right. I'm I'm automatically passionate. I sure. I am, will tell you right here publicly, I'm 100 percent biased um, yeah. for for the, their success. But I will say this: I constantly wish, even when I'm doing the review on a $500 sweater, I'm constantly thinking, oh my gosh, imagine if they did something. And I don't mean these brands, but but Eon. Imagine if they did something that could give access to everyone a college right. student you know i call it the frugal bond moment and it doesn't have to just be clothing it could be you know accessories one of the coolest things i thought they did i don't have it up here but you know a jotter pen or something that bond may have used yeah. you know it's just something to have that connection point but it does seem like they've moved away from that um, more and more which is curious to me well, and, and I saw a video you did recently about NPL. I forget if it was a live video at the time or, or afterwards, Probably. but, 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 but I saw it and it's like, yeah, I mean, there's obviously a place for that. It's, and there's a demand for that. I get that. But again, going kind of circling back to the start of this interview. So like when I got into it, you know, there were those figures we talked about those, those figures about this big. So what they did was, okay. What you got with it was you got these two things, you put it together like this. And so you had four backgrounds. One background was M's office. One background was Goldfinger's factory. One background probably had something to do with Dr. No. So in addition to those figurines, you had a little Aston Martin DB5. You had a little Goldfinger dragon. You had one of the figurines was Bond on the laser table. Um, one was M sitting at his desk and like, there was like this little, I don't know what you would call it, plexiglass or whatever thing you could pull up. Now that was, that wasn't from any movie that had to be based off the, um, man from the golden gun novel, which in the novel, it, you know, that protection shield came down from the ceiling, yeah. but you know, that's the best they could do <laughs> for those toys. Um, as I remember my dad explaining this, uh, what, what that was for, because he had read, the, like I said earlier, he had read the novel. So he told me what that related to. And, you know, there was a little Aston Martin. It had a little thing, you know, a little bulletproof shield you could pull up. Um, and with the, that little Dr. No dragon, I think you pressed a button in this like supposed, you know, 
plastic thing came out. It's supposed to be flames coming out of yes. the mouth. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, that was a way, that was a low entry point, relatively speaking. I mean, certainly low compared to $6,000 backgammon sets and so on and so forth. So I don't know if they're doing this strategically enough or not. Um, you know, I was, I obviously don't have the uh, access to all the information that they're processing, but I, I think it's a, I think it's a fair question. Yeah. And I, I, you know, again, you know, we're, we're kind of taking a, an outsider's view. We may have like little snippets inside the brands, but one of the things that I always found interesting is they seem to be going for bookend extreme. So you've got the high end uh, collector or you know person that can afford some of these luxury items. And usually it's going to be maybe an older, more established individual. And then you've also got some of the pieces that they've come out for what they're trying to equate to the younger generation. I know Eon has said um, they don't want, you know, future bonds to be your father's James Bond. So, right. you know, in trying to uh, adopt that to the younger audience, I don't know if Funko Pops are the right entry point. I mean, even right. my son, who's 23, said, you know, Dad, you know, they need to come out with like a computer game or something like that, that, that everybody can download on their phone and yeah. just play. And, and, you know, that's kind of the way of the future. Who knows what they're going to come out with, but we haven't seen it yet. Right. And, and, and that may be something they need to work through and, and, and maybe they are trying to work through it. Um, but I mean, we'll see. I just, all I know is like, I'm not going to get a $6,000 back Ammon set and I'm sure as hell Aww. not going to get a three and a half million dollar <laughs> Aston Martin DB five replica with gadgets. Cause that I can't even drive to work. So yeah, that's that's the outrageous part. I guess you just keep it in the basement and let it just form an oil spill and, and call it well, a day. Well, if you're like Jay Leno and you're like ridiculously rich and you own a you own a big, I don't know if it's a hangar. I, I actually for work I actually went had a chance to go to this thing. It was something Ford did in the 2000s, and so it's like out by the Burbank Airport, and so they took us there, and he's got this. Yeah, it's like a hangar, and it's like all yeah. these old cars and you know stuff like that. So if you've got Jay Leno money, you can buy one of those DB5 replicas and right. park it there, and you know you've got enough money to rent, you know, time at a racetrack to drive it and speed around. But you can't, you know, like I said, you can't drive it anywhere on an open road. So so Jay Leno, if you're watching this, and I know you are, please invite Bill and I over so we can play with your DB5. Yeah, there you that. go. Well, he doesn't he doesn't necessarily have a DB5. He's got lots of other cars to play with. Hopefully he got one. By yeah. the way, I do want to ask your opinion because, you know, part of this conversation is talking about advertising, getting butts yeah. and seats for the theater. Um, you know, and it's, listen, I know it's an eggshell conversation, but I'd love to get your opinion. How do you think it's going for No Time to Die? And, you know, you had your, the, the little sneak peek trailer behind the scenes. You obviously had Jamaica. Now you have the official poster. I'd love your comments on those things. I think they need to step up a little bit more. Um, you know what? If they don't want to do put out a teaser poster, fine. But like put out another teaser video. Like to be honest, I think that one minute teaser video was like kind of like the last time I got like excited because for one thing, I just thought it was different. Because, mm -hmm. you know, for both Spectre and Skyfall, they had done those video blogs. And some were okay, and some were like less okay, and just. Yeah. It, it, but it was a. Ch but but that, no time to die video. They didn't have the title yet. <laughs> was like a change up, and it's like, okay, yes. um, you know, I don't think they need to have a teaser trailer necessarily, but I think it's about time they put out something, just yeah. to kind of re like remind people because I mean here's what they're up against, um, okay. So like Mission Impossible, they, they're going to like do two movies back to back. And so yeah. the director goes on social media and announces a casting. And then the actress who has been cast she goes on social media. Yeah, I'm in the movie too. Yeah, thanks. And, and again, it's not, not like, you know, these movies aren't going to be out till 21 and 22. But, you know, they're like reminding people, hey, yeah. we're here. We're coming. 
you know, yeah. keep it keep it in mind and kind of like that teaser poster, that was like the last communication we got and nothing since. Yeah, it's interesting, too. I mean, Tom Cruise, who's kind of a, you know, his group is a master at this. Uh, he has two cameras, two social media cameras following him at all times. So they're they're able to kind of like there was a tour he did in a discussion with in the Ukraine, because I think they're going to be shooting in the Ukraine. Right. So they documented oh, yeah. all this and then they released it to the news they released it to the AP wires and the media, which was very smart of like, hey, this just happened. Well, guess where that came from? That came from Tom Cruise's camp. Right. So they're, they're very savvy with those types of assets. And and the whole point is they're just they're making sure you don't forget that it's coming. It's just like reminders here, reminders there. And it's like, I'm not sure Eon Danjak has quite figured that out yet. Maybe, yeah. maybe they have, but we'll see. Yeah, it's interesting with Eon, what I've um, been able to observe is uh, it's it's a little bit of the best and I don't want to say the worst, but um, I it, it almost seems like the fan base and Eon, there is an adversarial perception or attitude. It could be reciprocal from an adversarial yeah. standpoint of they don't get us, I don't get them. And that could have been from Eon's mouth and it could be the, from the fan's mouth. To me, that time needs to pass. Like there needs yeah. to be some sort of olive branch or you know breaking of this this brick wall that seems to have uh, built over time. Yeah, and, and you know what? I think it's the the place where it's easiest to do that is from the on side, and I think it's not going to happen until they decide. It's it's like when they hired that company to do those 90, you know, those conventions in 94, 95, that wasn't their first, they weren't used to doing that. And, but they yeah. felt their backs were against the wall, I guess. And they felt they had to do that. So I think if it's going to happen, it's got to come from them. And I know some people would just toast me alive for even suggesting that. Oh, how dare you say that? Um, Why would they toast you alive? Oh, I've I've been on the receiving end from there's there are some fans who are like take the attitude that Eon is right all the time and who are you to criticize them and it's like I don't even really think I'm criticizing I I think I'm kind of like bringing up the obvious but you know there are some people who just take that attitude and see I don't you know see what? it as a critique I think I think you're making a very good observation it's like any I mean we're talking about marketing. And in right. marketing, all good marketing is iterative and it's experiential. If you, as the recipient of their marketing, do not find it is the most positive experience, you're providing feedback. In Like I'm in the pharmaceutical industry. If we had patients and doctors raise their hand and say, can I tell you something about your brand? We'd be like this. Yeah, because that's yeah. the most valuable thing that we can receive. You're not, you're not critiquing. You're, you're giving feedback. Over Twitter, just in the past two days as we record this, I saw two or three of these tweets from uh, Disney Lucasfilm, two months to go before the next Star Wars movies comes out. Like, that's like standard operating procedure these days. And, you know, we're, we're under six months to go before No Time to Die. And, like, the, the videos I saw for the next Star Wars Star Wars movie, that's maybe a little intense, but like, I don't know, if it were me, just as an idea, they're supposed to like wrap up filming this week, maybe. It's like, I would yeah, put out something. Second unit finished today. Right, they they finished up and like first unit's still working, but they sh they're, they're supposed to be done like within the next week. I would put out something, we wrapped up filming today and just, you know, and that's all you have to say. You don't have to give out yeah. spoilers or anything and you know, do something like that. And just, and that, that could be, you know, the beginning of the post-production uh, promotion schedule. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that would be great. And by the way, you know, I, I, I do understand what you're saying as far as, you know, what some people feel about this. The reason I even wanted to have this conversation, because I think, I think the way things are marketed, promoted, merchandise, and, and even advertised, it is an evolution, and, but it's not just, uh, forward motion sometimes it's right. backward motion so it's it's all good discussion i mean it really yeah. is
Well, sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back. I mean, that's that's business in general and marketing in general. You you have to kind of adjust on the fly sometimes. Yeah. Well, I think I think if nothing else, Eon and the entire franchise has got to be excited that they've got passionate fans that will sit on a phone like this and Skype and things like that, supporting their yeah. name and their brand. So if nothing else, we've got the passion to an all new level. So that's a good thing. Okay. Well, listen, Bill, thank you, thank you, thank you. Believe it or not, uh, we have we have done, you know, all these years, 57 years uh, in an hour and 10 minutes. Um, there was so much more, I'm sure we've left under and on the table, but will you come back and do this again? Oh, absolutely. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed Good. it a lot. Good. Well, thank you so much for helping me. If I did this alone, my mouth would be so dry. It would be very <laughs> bad. And you've got such an incre uh, incredible history of real experiences that you've done, as well as just some of the research and reading. So thank you for bringing that today. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks for asking me. I, I, I had a great time. Great. And we're going to put up all of Bill's links below where you can stalk him and find him and give him your opinion and listen to him. He's just an incredible source and very entertaining. This has been also David Zaritsky for The Bond Experience, and we will see you real soon. Take care. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from the Bond Experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you just because we know you. Talk to you soon.